One of the things I have done in the last 12 or so years since I left Oxford after my ordination has been to study in Washington, D.C. at the Dominican House of Studies for a license in sacred uh, theology. And among the classes that we had, and I have to say classes take a lot more time in the USA, uh, they would be 20 or 22 weeks or so, uh, and normally we would be sitting in class for uh, easily an hour and a half, if not three hours, um, much more than the 45 minutes for eight weeks that we get here. And one of the more interesting ones uh, that I attended was a class on exorcism and demonology. And a trained exorcist, a very experienced man, a, a priest, uh, said to us one day, read the gospel, read the gospel through the lens of the devil. If you were a demon, how would you react to what Jesus is doing here, he said. And I have heard of all kinds of hermeneutics of how we might read the scriptures, and this was a new one to me. Read the scriptures through the lens of the demons. But of course, here in Oxford, we're familiar with C.S. Lewis and perhaps his screw tape letters, where he does a similar thing, so as to help us to think with the mindset of the enemy. The initial chapter of Mark's Gospel, which we've been hearing then, is a declaration of war, isn't it, against those who have the charge of this world. A declaration of an assault against the foreign occupation of sin, Satan, disease, and death, which will be overthrown in the Gospels. For the time has arrived, the rule of God has come, so change your minds, trust this proclamation. These words are a rephrasing of what we have heard in last Sunday's reading, but they've been stripped of their familiar ecclesiastical language. And as effectively, though, what it means. As Rowan Williams says, this is an announcement that God is taking over. And so we should expect change and also expect to be changed. Mark's Gospel opens then with a declaration of war against those powers of darkness that have held mankind in thrall since the initial deception and the original rebellion of Eve and Adam. Having made this declaration, Jesus then gathered his co-fighters around him, those who would follow him. For he will train them, he says, to fish souls out of the murky darkness of sin, to call sinners forth from the watery depths through the attraction of light. And Christ himself will be the light. And so he will make his followers to become, through their good works, through their liberating works, become a light of the world. And so today's gospel takes us to the first public work of Jesus after he's called his co-fighters around him. And so we see this first battle against the enemy. I just noticed as I was reading just now, um, Jesus comes to the synagogue and he teaches. And then Mark says, immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, I sort of skimmed over that the first time I read this a few days ago, because this immediately, at once, these are Mark's ways of writing. And it's always to show this urgency and immediacy to the gospel. And yet, reading it again through the lens of the demons, Jesus has come to proclaim, you know, as we hear in other gospels, liberty to captives. He's basically making a declaration of war. He's going to set people free from the dev devil's thrall. And of course, then, immediately, there's a response and a pushback. And so, there's another little thing that we have to notice. It happens on Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, Jesus is in the synagogue. And we might think, well, yes, this makes sense, because the synagogue is where people will be gathered, and they'll be gathered for the Sabbath. So if you want to reach a big crowd, do that. But of course, what is the Sabbath about? 
The Sabbath is a sign of God's covenant with his people, a promise and a reminder of his closeness to his people. It's also a sign of man's dignity made for this covenantal relationship with God. And so on this day of rest, we are to strengthen our friendship with God. And also the Sabbath is a memorial then of Israel's liberation from slavery and drudgery and work, freed from Egypt for worship, that is to enter into relationship with God. That's what the Sabbath is about. And so the devil wants to sunder that relationship with God. He wants us to remain not free to worship God, but to worship our desires, our passions, and so on. And so when the Lord comes to liberate the man from the unclean spirit on the Sabbath day, he is restoring to him the dignity and the freedom of the Sabbath. And that, of course, is what our Lord has done for you and for me. We gather on our Sabbath for the Sunday Eucharist. We gather like this to celebrate that our Lord has set us free. We listen to his word that heals the divisions of our world. We receive his body and blood, for he is our champion who comes to fight for us, to fight alongside us, and to teach us true freedom. He comes too, though, to challenge then everything that holds us back from loving him. And this challenge can be unsettling. The unclean spirit says, what have you to do with us? And so there is immediately a kind of challenge. The demon is challenging Jesus' encroachment on Satan's territory. He's placing a limit on where God has a say, delineating the boundaries of God's rule. Hence, we know that it is sometimes claimed, we might have heard it said, that God or religion or the church should stay out of politics or academia or even the bedroom. Our faith, some may say, should not be allowed to interfere with how we vote, say on issues of immigration or indeed recycling, nor how we run our businesses and make money, nor how we might raise our children or ought to care for the most vulnerable in human society. However, the gospel, when it is proclaimed and heard in all its fullness, will necessarily challenge and indeed threaten the structures of sin in society and also our personal habits of sin. Rightly then does the demon say, have you come to destroy us? For Christ comes to declare that the reign of sin and death, the stranglehold of Satan is ended, and so everything that lacks the optimal, optimal good all that is an obstacle to true human flourishing, all that does not lead to the abundance of life which Christ comes to give us, must give way. Indeed, Jesus, who is life and love itself, comes to destroy whatever holds mankind back from fully living and fully loving. Thus, he exercises the man with the unclean spirit, commanding the demon to leave him. His first assault, as I've said, against the evil one and of his realm. And in doing so, he declares too, that we belong to God. We belong to God. The Sabbath has been made for us so that that belonging to God can be strengthened. God Firstly, has created us and holds us in being. We belong to him so long as we draw breath and have being. And then moreover, at our own baptism, remember, the Father's voice has declared, you are my beloved son, you my beloved daughter. The demon, of course, isn't going to take this lying down. And there's again a bit of pushback. He reveals Jesus' identity. 
Now, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus repeatedly keeps his identity secret so that he can reveal himself to the people in his own way, in what he deems to be the best time, so that he can avoid any misunderstandings. But now his name has been revealed, and so the people uh, misunderstand, and his fame spreads everywhere, it's said, because of this. Now it raises a question, an issue that perhaps still pertains today. The people are alerted to Jesus' presence and what he can do, and they go to him in huge and great numbers and throng to him because they want wonders and miracles, perhaps an easier life. We hear the apostles saying this, you know, give us thrones at your right and your left in heaven. We want influence, privilege, comfort. Is this why people go to Jesus? Is this perhaps still why some would go to Jesus? Or do they go to him as Jesus would want, because they want to follow him, even to the cross and beyond? Jesus, after all, will struggle in the Gospels to teach his true followers, his own disciples and apostles, that he came to serve, to be crucified, to suffer for sinners, that is, to suffer even for those who hate him. And only then will he rise again from the dead. But the demons are not to know this secret, because Christ's death would become, as St. Augustine put it, a trap for the devil by which he was ensnared. But what the demons do know is that Jesus is the Holy One of God, who thus will destroy the unholy just as light shatters the darkness. But they do not know, nor do they understand, the means by which Christ shall destroy death. But we do. Indeed, Jesus tells us that we too will have to die to ourselves. We too must follow him to the cross daily, taking up battle against sin, so that the old me and all our sinful desires must be destroyed and vanquished. In just a few weeks' time, we will indeed enter that holy season of Lent when we shall prepare, or rather, we shall indeed take up battle against the enemy. But today, traditionally, is called Septuagesima Sunday. It starts a period of what's called pre-Lent, so that we can start preparing ourselves to take up battle, which you might think is a very wise thing indeed. Therefore, we who struggle still in our daily battle must learn to flee to the Holy One of God, who is our only champion. We strive then to give our undivided attempt devotion to the Lord, turning to Him in prayer in our every need, and in prayer listening again for the true voice of the Lord. Because the voice of the accuser has been silenced, in the Gospel, Jesus has said to the demon, literally, Be muzzled, so let us never give audience to the lies and seductions and fake news of the devil, who is, as St. Augustine says, like a dog on a chain, and can only bite someone who, deathly sure of himself, dares to go near him. Let us flee to Christ, rather, placing our confidence in him, and in the victory of his holy cross. Thus, I leave you with these words of St. Peter in Scripture, who says, Resist the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of you throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you.